Apologetics seeks to give credible answers to curious questions. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. My name is Bobby Conway. I am here with my buddy, Naeem. Good to see you, bro. Thanks hey, man. for coming on the program. Yeah, glad to be here. You know, uh, in the Charlotte area, uh, we just really appreciate you as a pastor, uh, lead pastor, founder of the Church Mosaic. And uh, you've done a great work there. You also travel around and you speak. And part of your story that's really uh, been a big hit for people to listen to, obviously, is what God's done in your life. Uh, you've been converted out of Islam and became a Christian. Tell us a little bit about that. How'd that happen? Yeah. So, yeah, I grew up in a Muslim uh, household. I'm actually Pakistani. <laughs> and so we grew up a Sunni Muslim, if you know, a Sunni. I grew up Sunni, and uh, uh, but what's unique is that I actually was born and raised in the Middle East, and so my parents migrated to Kuwait. That's where I was born and raised, and um, yeah, grew up there. Grew up uh, like a conservative. Um, Muslim, uh, but uh, uh, my brother actually got accepted to a college here in the States after graduating from high school and came actually accepted Jesus. And then he came and told me and I threatened to kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my first uh, interaction with the gospel. Sheesh. And I mean, you really were feeling like he's got to die for that belief in Jesus. Oh, yeah, I did. I mean, he wanted to tell mom and dad and I was so against it. In fact, I threatened to kill him. Uh, it was so bad. And uh, he didn't tell mom and dad that summer when he came back from mm -hmm. uh, and then he, he left, and then something crazy happened. Uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, if you remember, the first Absolutely. Gulf War in 1990. And so my family and I were stuck there. So I've got two brothers, two sisters. We are all stuck in the Gulf War. And in 1992, we got a chance to come to the U.S. Well, I did. Yeah. And uh, upon hearing about your brother believing in Jesus, you threatened to kill him. Uh, what did your heart begin to soften to Jesus and then basically to let him off the hook, thankfully? <laughs> oh, uh, no, I didn't actually. Okay. It did not soften at all. In fact, wow. he, uh, so he told me this in Kuwait, came yeah. to the States. Yeah. After the war, I got to the States. Okay. And the reason I came to the States is because my high school literally blew up. I mean, you know, I didn't graduate from high school. Uh, it was a war zone. And uh, so my dad uh, got a tourist visa yeah. and said, hey, listen, don't come back. Figure it out. So I come to the States, um, and this is Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, my brother invites me to FCA, mm -hmm. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, yeah. and uh, this collegiate event, and he just I said, just come, and um, I didn't know anybody, so I came, and but I, that's where I heard about this gospel. Um, but again, it, it didn't really soften me. I didn't know anything about the gospel. Mm -hmm. I knew that I didn't want to be, become like my brother, but what was very intriguing to me was the confidence that some of these students had about what they believed. Hmm. Um, well, uh, several nights uh, after that, I was in my room and uh, it was about 11 or 12 o'clock at night and I had just finished reading a novel um, and uh, put, my, put the book down and stretched, just stretched on my bed. And uh, as I was stretching, all of a sudden I noticed that the room was getting just, uh, I don't know, dark, but not really physically dark. It was just getting weird and uh, evil. And I was like, what, what's going on? And as I'm thinking these thoughts, something uh, grabs me from my shoulders and drags me and pins me to my pillow. And you know, at that point, my body begins to react. And finally, the door opens up, and I'm thinking it's my brother that's going to walk in and rescue me. But in walks this figure, which later on I found out was a demon. And as it walks to my bed, it sort of is communicating that it's going to kill me. And I, I'm convinced now that if it gets me, I'm dying that night. You know, at that same moment, I think, I, I was just going through my head about, okay, Allah is, is the God of Islam, is this, can He help? And I just knew, for some reason, this was beyond Him. And so I thought, Jesus, did I, can He help? And so, as I'm thinking these thoughts, this figure is coming towards my bed, it reaches my bed and then disappears. I can't see Him anymore. Whatever was holding me down, you know, gets released, and I'm, I can move again. So I got up from my bed and ran out of the room. Woke up my brother, 
Mahmoud and asked him, you know, told him what had happened. And, and he at first said, did you have a dream? And, and I said, no, this was real, this was real. I remember still saying, listen, my shoulders are hurting from whatever was holding me down here. And so he began to uh, talk to me about um, the whole experience. And I was like, you know, that's, this is great, but I am terrified. So help me out here, what's going on? And I said, you know, I really believe this thing is going to kill me. And he said, well, um, there's only one person that has authority over demons and angels. And I said, who? He said, it's Jesus. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm praying to him and I, you know, whatever, uh, you know, sign me out pretty much. Thing as you can see, I've seen uh, myself, uh, Jesus in dreams, and I did not uh, convert to Christianity because I've seen actually uh, he was affirming Islam in my dreams. So you can't just base base your life necessarily just on dreams. Dreams have a big importance even in Islam, but we know very well that that's not what we base our life on. We do not base our Sharia on dreams. Dreams can be an indication. Dreams can be uh, even a a warning. Dreams can be. Uh, revelation, even as the Prophet said, of righteous people from Revelation, this can be something that part of dreams. However, if it goes against the established facts in the Sharia, the established facts in the Quran and the Sunnah, this is rejected. And we know very well, we need to couple everything, we need to put everything in a package. The Prophet told us that dreams, many dreams are for shaitan, and that shaitan himself can take the form of many things except Prophet Muhammad right? So this is one way to answer because a lot of things, well, I saw Jesus. Well, shaitan can take the shape of Jesus. Shaitan can take the shape of many different things and come to you and try to deceive you. Naeem, you just shared, um, you know, how you felt in your own life. You were empty, you were struggling, you were wondering, God, where are you? You felt a lot of dom demonic influence going on in your life, looking to your brother to kind of give an explanation, what the heck's going on, and then encountering Jesus. And uh, my question to you would be, because in the Western world, you know, there's a lot of skepticism about that, but we read about how there's lots of Muslims that are experiencing this, do you find that that is the case? What you've experienced, you hear happening in other parts of the Islamic world. Ah, uh, yes, of course. I mean, you know, it's so true that uh, that uh, Muslims continually talk about either a man in white or they they you know they pretty much uh, have the similar story uh, like mine. So my story might be a huge thing in the Western world, but if you go to Egypt, for example, or even Pakistan uh, or Kuwait, you'll have Muslims who've had similar experiences. Related to Islam, what about Jesus coming to Muslims in dreams? Is that real? Is that real conversion? Isn't that demotivating for missions? Um... I don't know whether it demotivates or not. It, I think it deflects. It deflects the way you pray. I've heard people pray, oh God, give them dreams. Oh God, give them dreams. Because they've heard stories that somebody had a dream and there are different kinds of dreams. I got no problem with somebody having a dream that a redhead white guy shows up at his door with a book in their hand with a message they need. That's a glorious dream because they're going to get saved when the redhead knocks on the door, white face, book in the hand. Whoa, I had a dream about you and they believe in Jesus. That's very different than having a dream of Jesus coming to them in their head, preaching the gospel to them that they've never heard of before and believing it and being saved. That I'm suspicious of big time because of reasons I'll give you tomorrow of why I think the gospel needs to be heard. How shall they believe unless they hear? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? That's a pretty significant argument in Romans 10. And it doesn't say, well, they'll hear because they'll get dreams. So that argument is invalid. So let's be careful when we, when we think dreams that we don't think replacing the biblical paradigm of how people get saved. People get saved by hearing the gospel preached and it says, how shall they preach unless they be sent? It doesn't say, oh, they can preach in a dream when they're not even there. So I'm very suspicious of those stories where a person actually hears the whole gospel, claims to hear the whole gospel for the first time in their head during a dream, and they got saved without any connection with the church. I, I just but big question mark over that. Okay, so I, I don't know the details of these visions, but I do know uh, as, as an imam working with the community, sometimes people 
uh, want to convert to Islam. Um, this could be for a variety of, of reasons. Some people say they have a dream. Sometimes they saw something in the dream that convinces them that Islam is the truth. Uh, in, in my own uh, studies, I'm not inclined to this uh, uh, way of proving something to be right. Somebody has a dream, somebody has a vision, and so on. I more prefer to look at the facts on the ground and then make up our minds as to what is the right direction. So somebody may convert to Islam as a result of a dream. Somebody may convert to Christianity as a result of a dream. Uh, I say, let's look at the facts. And, and maybe your dream might give you a stimulus, might make you want to investigate something. But please, do investigate before you embrace. And I think part of that is connected to the identity that we have to let go of mm -hmm. to, to embrace the identity of Christ. I mean, uh, it, we didn't... Muslims don't grow up in a world where, uh, or a society where you, it's okay to discover your own spirituality. Yeah. You're born a certain way, you'll die a, uh, that way. And so leaving Islam is like leaving um, your nationality and you become a traitor. So in fact, that's why I got a religious asylum from the government. Reports are coming in of thousands of refugees, Muslim refugees, that are now converting to Christianity. Now, there isn't any hard data on the exact numbers of individuals that are converting to Christianity or the reasons why they're doing it. But some are speculating that it's a mix of many different reasons, including just wanting to change their religion because they identify more with Christianity or because they want to get asylum in certain countries where Muslims are discriminated against. I'll, I'll have to say that they're not converting to Christianity because suddenly they saw the light, hallelujah. I'll have to say that they're doing what they feel is best for them to increase their odds of being able to stay as refugees in Germany. So in fact, that's why I got a religious asylum from the government. Uh, because if once you've converted to Christianity, they then, when you're seeking asylum, say, well, if I go back now as a Christian, ah. I'm in a lot of trouble and right. I could be killed sure. for that. So give me asylum. Netherlands goes, yeah, 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 I see the trick you're playing. Whereas Germany goes, yeah, yeah, mach schnell, mm -hmm. give them the <laughs> right. uh, asylum. And literally, like Max Schnell, they, they, it becomes quicker and easier to do it. So if you're having a debate as to the main reason they're doing it, I'm sure there are others. You know what that's Mark probably means? the main reason. Yeah. Do you know I what Max be Schnell means? Because based on Sharia law, which is a Muslim law, anybody who converts, who's actually born and raised a Muslim, is punishable by death. Well, the apostasy law has been much misunderstood in Islam. It became a standard law that the apostate should be put to death. And this was widely accepted in, in, in all of the major fixed schools. But if one were to uh, look carefully at the basis of that law, one would see that it's very shallow. There is no basis for it in the Quran. Quite the contrary. The Quran speaks about people embracing Islam, leaving it, toying with it, going back and forth. And if the Prophet Muhammad himself were killing people for doing any such thing, they wouldn't dare to do it in Medina where the Prophet Muhammad had risen to power. So it is very clear from the Quranic evidence that uh, there should have been no such law in Islam that the apostate should be killed. Moreover, chapter 2 verse 256 in the Quran says categorically there is no compulsion in religion. And if you force a person to remain a Muslim by threatening death if he were to dare to leave, then obviously you're contradicting the Quran. So Muslims have become comfortable in, in, in some ways uh, in, in the acting contrary to the Quran. They have enacted laws and made them popular, but that does not mean, mean that that is definitive uh, of, of what I would want Islam to, to be and what I consider to be the religion of God as taught uh, in the Quran. Uh, folks, not every law. And we have agreed that some laws in the Bible really are from God. But you, you, you take a look at this one. See if really you would recommend this law today. This is from Deuteronomy chapter uh, 13. In verse number 13, Deuteronomy number th chapter 13, verse 13, if in any of the cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, you hear it said that certain scoundrels have sprung up among you and have led astray the inhabitants of their city to serve other gods whom you have not known. You must inquire carefully into the matter and investigate it thoroughly. If you find that it is true and an established fact that this abomination has been committed in your midst, you shall put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, dooming the city and all life that is in it even its cattle to the sword. Having heaped up all its spoils in the middle of its square, you shall burn the city with its spoils as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. Let it be a heap of ruins forever, never to be rebuilt. You shall not 
retain anything that is doomed that the blazing wrath of the Lord may die down and he may, he may show you mercy and in his mercy for you may multiply you as he promised your fathers on oath because you have heeded the voice of the Lord your God keeping all his commandments which I enjoin on you today doing what is right in his sight wow. number 11 the United Nations documents on human rights de demanding freedom of thought you see the, the Quran doesn't agree with that so therefore the Quran is not the word of God well if a document has to agree with the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, what would you say to Deuteronomy chapter 13, where it says that if anyone commits apostasy, you should kill that person, you should stone that person to death. And it says furthermore, if your brother, your sister, your wife, your whoever, your closest ones, if they call you to worship someone else other than the God that you have known, you should be the first one to stone him to death. It says in verse 11, you shall stone him to death because he sought to lead you astray from the Lord your God. That I'm sure will not agree with the United Nations declarations on human rights. Wow.